Church Glendora. My name is Karen Rugley and I am on our teaching team here and it's my honor to welcome you to our online service today. If you are new and this is your first time tuning in, we'd love to get to know you. In the chat next to me, there's going to be a little box that pops up that says I'm new. Click on that. Fill out some of that information so we can get to know you and you can find out more about who we are as a church community. I do have a couple of announcements for you. I want you all to stay tuned for a summer calendar that should be hitting your email inboxes within the next week. On there, you're gonna find a combination of online and in-person gatherings. If you are not on our church email list, now would be a great time to do that. To get on there, what you need to do is email info at vineyardglendora.com. Once again, info at vineyardglendora.com. Send us your information and we will make sure that you get whatever we are talking about, whatever is being communicated from our church so that you have it and can get connected with us further. Another fun announcement. Next week is Father's Day. We have a really fun tradition that we've done the last number of years in our church. In fact, if you've been present, you know that it's a favorite Sunday because by and large, we hear a crash of a root beer bottle. We usually serve dad's root beer to everyone on Father's Day. And so we're going to continue that tradition, but we're gonna do it at Finkbeiner Park. So next Sunday from two to 4 p.m., stop by Finkbeiner Park where the bandstand is and pick up a dad's root beer for you I will say, monitor your children so they only get one because I know that my two boys like to try and pick up three or four at least. But we would love to have you join us next Sunday to celebrate all of the dads and the men in our church. This morning, I woke up with a song stuck in my head. I woke up singing, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. And now, you're welcome. That song will be stuck in your head for the rest of the day. <laughs> but what I love about that song, and more, more importantly, what I love about the power of music is it has the ability to unite us. It has the ability to bring us together, even though we may be in different houses, sitting on different couches, and in different cities, and probably in different states. There's something so powerful about singing together to the one God who is over and above all things. So this morning, would you join me in singing as we worship together the one God from our different spaces? Good morning, church. Good morning. We're so glad that you've joined us. We're here in Rainier's front yard um, having our our worship jam and we're so glad that you're with us here today uh, we believe that by singing together that we stay connected and we stay close to one another and most importantly we stay close to God mm -hmm. In 
such goodness And oh, the shame that we would spend it all To turn and fall into darkness God will see how through your son you turn Lost and hurt into glory, and how when scorned and death you raised him up, his gains become the whole world's story. Let all things rise and bless your name. All things may. Through two, five through nine says this: I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. 
With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. The heavens praise your wonders, your faithfulness too, and the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord Almighty, in your faithfulness, surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. You 
devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus. comes from Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Well, good morning, friends. So great to be with you again today. Um, full disclosure, before jumping into another teaching from the Bible, I don't know about you, but I am still very much trying to get my physical, emotional, intellectual and spiritual feet under me this week. It was like I had just gotten into the Groundhog Day groove of quarantine living and parenting and ministry only to wake up almost two weeks ago now to the images of a knee on a neck to the horrific murder of George Floyd and the video that we've all seen playing over and over again. It once again surfaced in our country so much frustration and pain and grief and anger, and it ignited all that we have seen played out before us these last few weeks. So I have spent, I spent much of last week being kind of fairly angry and somewhat despondent, which if you know me is not my uh, normal MO. I was uh, reactionary to almost anyone and everyone and everything. I 
had just about stopped watching the news with the sudden disappearance of Dr. Fauci, and then again last week I'm right back to nonstop news cycle after cycle. I found myself going to bed tired and waking up tired, which is exhausting. I found myself trying to engage intellectually challenging thoughts, ideas, articles, and books, which is all rather exhausting. I found myself having deep conversations with family members about institutional racism and its historical connection to the evangelical church. And let me tell you, that's a bit exhausting. And I found myself spending way too much time online, especially on social media. And that too was rather exhausting. And you know what I found, especially when it comes to social media, and maybe you found this too, uh, the people that I am connected to, Facebook calls them my friends, they all seem to have very, very, very different thoughts and opinions and ideas about what's going on in our country right now. What I have found is that fingers are pointed in every direction and solutions to the collective issues of our day are equally diverse as they are opinionated. And this, again, is all rather exhausting. And yet, I know that my exhaustion is very privileged exhaustion. I fully realize that my exhaustion pales in comparison with the exhaustion, especially of our uh, black brothers and sisters and the exhaustion that they must feel seeing the same images and the same videos over and over who keep getting up time and time again and keep on walking and keep on fighting. And so that said, I come to you today very much in the spirit of what Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 when he wrote these words. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony of God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. And so my, my sincere heart's desire this morning, in the midst of all that I don't know and all that I'm continuing to press into and learn and listen to and discern, my heart's desire is to, like Paul says here, know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I'm under a bit of personal conviction this week to get back to that pursuit and that focus first and foremost, to know nothing except Jesus Christ, to fix my eyes on him, to recalibrate, to recenter myself, and let that be what guides me forward into the important and complex issues and discussions that we still must press into. You know, at the very end of that same chapter, in Philippians chapter 2, uh, Paul actually quotes the prophet Isaiah out of Isaiah 40, verse 13. And, and he quotes a question that Isaiah poses, which is this, Who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? In other words, if, if we could just know what God thinks, the mind of the Lord, what he thinks on all of these things, then we'd know what to say, and we'd know what to do, and we'd know how to, to move forward with godly wisdom. But here's the good news. Paul poses a question, but then he kind of answers the question with a statement in the very next verse. And this is what I pray leads me forward and leads us forward in as a community of faith when he says this. But we have the mind of Christ. It's as if he's saying, in the midst of the anger... And in the midst of the grief and the finger pointing and the opinions and the exhaustion, we have the opportunity to take hold of something that can lead us forward to think different thoughts if we dare to press into it. But, but let me warn you up front, it might not be what we expect. It may, in fact, challenge some of the dominant narratives and some of the dominant responses we see playing out right in front of us even as we speak. And yet I promise you, if you and I will resolve to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified, and, and to pursue together the mind of Christ 
it will lead us boldly forward into the kind of community and the kind of world I know we so desperately desire. And with that pursuit in mind, I want to now take us back to Paul's letter to the Philippians, where there may be no more beautiful or more timely place to land, considering our current cultural state, than chapter 5, uh, verse 2. You know, after exhorting his friends to reject selfish ambition, to pursue humility in their, by valuing others above themselves, Paul starts with these words, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And so with my own mind spinning and, and so unsettled these past two weeks, I found myself reading that and going, yes, that, that's what I want. I want that same mind to be in me, that, that, that mind of Christ, which I assume means that my thinking would align with the thinking of Christ, which then begs the question, if I tapped into that same mind, the mind of Christ, what would my mind look like? What thoughts would I think about the issues of our day? And how would those thoughts inform the decisions I make and how I choose to live and approach those same issues? Paul goes on to say that this kind of mindset, the mindset of Christ, it involves some things. And, and, and you better be careful what you ask for because here's what he says it involves. Because he says, who though being in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You want to know the mindset of Christ, Paul says? He says that mindset, it's going to involve submission and servitude and humility and obedience and self-sacrifice, which, let's be honest, those are all things that are rarely chanted at conventions and, and rallies and conferences, are they? But perhaps we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, because I think to truly understand how what Paul is writing speaks to our day and our time, I think we need to go back to how would his original hearers have heard this, his original audience. Now, I'm going to struggle for the next few minutes to adequately explain how foreign Paul's view was, or would have been, how foreign his view of divinity and power and strength and leadership would have been for the ears of his original audience, and it may still be for some of ours today. We'll just have to wait and see. You know, if Paul's friends would have been asked about to identify a leader or, and a mindset of a leader that, that would be regarded as powerful and strong and influential. I guarantee one of the first perhaps historical leaders that would have come to some of their minds would have in fact been Alexander the Great. Why Alexander? Well, the city they were living in, Philippi, was in fact a city that was founded by Alexander's father, Philip II of Macedon in 356 BC. You may remember, Alexander the Great, by the time he was age 20, had already risen uh, to power. He had ascended the throne in Macedonia. And then he had set out, uh, he had set about the task then, after that, of basically conquering the known world. Because that is, I guess, what in fact will make you great. The great. He had a mindset. His mindset uh, of greatness uh, was to suppress and to oppress, and to overpower, and to dominate, and to conquer, and to take more. And he succeeded in doing that, such that by the time he died at the ripe old age of 33, <laughs> interesting age, he had succeeded with that mindset to such an extent that it made sense in the mindset of the day to regard him as divine, as a god. Now, now, I think we have to start, it's important to start with that mindset and that way of thinking about power and strength and greatness and leadership and religion to truly grasp how subversive and how utterly countercultural Paul's 
gospel message about Jesus was. And you know what? Paul was simply tapping in to what Jesus taught his followers back in the Gospels. If you, if you go back uh, to Mark chapter 10, remember, Jesus actually says these words to his followers about his mindset. Listen, Jesus called them together and said, You know how those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials, the political officials, how they exercise authority over them by what I just described. You know that, that mindset. You know how they work and how they get power. And then he says this, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Friends, we got to sit with that. Jesus' own words about greatness for a minute. And compare and contrast how, how the pagan gods and the heroic, powerful, effective leaders of their day operated within how Jesus of Nazareth chose to operate. Paul says that Jesus didn't grasp for power or authority. He didn't use his power to exploit others. That was not his mindset. Instead, Paul says, he willingly laid down his rights. He, he gave it up. You know, grasping for power to be like the gods or to be like God, that's as old as Adam. We've seen that since Genesis 3. And leaders like Alexander and Augustus after him, I mean, they were just doing what the human race has always done. But Paul poetically portrays Jesus as walking a different path to greatness, one that embodies submission and servitude and humility and obedience and self-sacrifice. Jesus chooses not to march on the oppressed, but to march with the oppressed and then to lay down his life for them. And in doing so, don't miss this. In doing so, Paul says, this is not a decision to stop being divine or to stop being strong or to stop being powerful. Rather, it is a decision to show what real power and real strength and real divinity looks like. I mean, they can oppress life and they can dominate, and they can take life, and they can conquer. And, and that is power, and that is authority that must make them feel so divine. But Jesus says, well, I'm going to walk I'm going to walk alongside the ones that they oppress, and, and I'm going to give my life for all that they have taken, and then, and then I'm going to take my life up again, and I'm going to conquer, and I'm going to dominate sin and death. You know, the gods, the rulers, and the, the politicians of Philippi, yeah, they were known for using their positions and using their authority for their, for their own self-promotion. That's just how it worked. That was the mindset of the day. But Paul says Jesus did the opposite. He pursued service and humility, not because he wasn't God, but precisely because he was and so Paul is telling us that if we want to have the mind of Christ, if we want the same mind and to think about power and influence and strong, divinely inspired leadership, then we must start with self-giving humility and love. You know, friends, I think this shakes us to the core of our understanding about the pursuit of power. And I believe even more, ultimately, it shakes at the core of our understanding of who Jesus is and what it truly means to be one of his followers. You know, you know, most of Paul's original audience, the original readers, steeped in the mindset of how divinity and power and religion work uh, together in what I just described, I guarantee they would have been shocked beyond belief to read the poem about Jesus that Paul recites there. They would have been shocked beyond belief about the idea that the one true God could be, most no, could be known most fittingly in a dead Jewish peasant hanging on a tree. That's power. That's strength. 
that's greatness? Who would have thought? And, and I'm led to believe today, based on many of the, the thoughts and the ideas and the opinions that I've heard and that I've read the past few weeks, I'm led to believe that many people in our world would find this same mindset equally as difficult. Which leads me to wonder, have we too easily allowed ourselves to slide into what kind of amounts to a pagan view of deity and power and greatness? And as I said to some of my family members in one of those exhausting exchanges, could it be that the mindset that some well-meaning religious people have today that, that we've bought into would not in fact have room for the mindset of Jesus? And that begs the question is, if the mindset that some people have bought into doesn't have room for the Christ, at what point does it stop being Christian and become something else? People of God, we need to take a good long look once again at the incarnate Son of God hanging on that tree. And when we do, the most powerful thought you and I should be thinking in that moment is this. This is the true meaning of who God is. He is self-giving, sacrificial love. Which is why all week, with my mind spinning on this thought and that thought and this idea and that opinion, all week I've come back to knowing nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. If our mindset starts any other place with visions of grandeur and po of power and greatness, then it's high time we do what Paul poetically invites us to do and to, to start with Jesus and him crucified and then begin to rethink your image and your picture of God from there. When we do, you know what we'll find? We'll find a God who is, no, who is known most clearly when he abandons his rights and empties himself for the sake of the healing of the world. That is the mind of Christ. That's the same mind, the pattern of thinking that should belong to those of us who claim to be followers of this Christ. And that, my friends, is the mindset that we must pray into us as we move forward and as we do as he did, as we lay down our lives for the sake of the community and the sake of the world. May God give us the grace to have the mindset of his beloved son. Abigail's gonna now come and share some practical ways that we can begin to live this out, to have this mind of Christ even this week. So until next time, grace and peace to you. So I wanna start out by clarifying that having the mind of Christ is not the result of being able to know and follow all of the rules. It's not even the result of having so scrutinized and disciplined every aspect of your life to the point that you beat yourself into Christ-likeness, but rather the life that operates under the authority of King Jesus is quite simply the life that has done work with Jesus, that knows Jesus, that spends time with Jesus. The Christian life is not the overflow of forced obedience. The Christian life is the overflow of a soul that has been transformed by the power and the presence and the love and the grace of Jesus. What happens in our outer life is a direct result of what is going on in our inner life. And so if what is coming out of us, if what we see in the external is unhealthy or destructive expressions of our fear and our anger, if what we see happening outside of us is this need to assert power and authority over others in order to feel in control, if what we see is actions that are self-preserving rather than self-giving, or even if we just have this overwhelming sense that the responsibility of the world is on our shoulders. 
then perhaps we must ask ourselves if our inner life is doing the necessary work that it needs to do with Jesus. So actions that purely reflect the mind of Christ happen when there is integrity, alignment between the inner and the outer lives. Jesus himself speaks to this call for integrity when he says in the book of Luke chapter 6 verses 43 through 45, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit, for each tree is known by its fruit. Figs are not gathered from thorns, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasures of the heart produces good. And the evil person out of the evil treasures produces evil, for it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. So when you take a look at, at what is flowing out of your life right now, what's coming out of your life, maybe it's in the conversations that you find yourself or that automatic response to a, a news headline flashing across your screen, or, or it's your automatic responses to people's expressions of pain, of suffering. Do you find that you are more patiently listening or viscerally reacting? Are you more sensitive to the cry of the oppressed than you are to your own need to feel right, to your own need to pursue your best interests? Or perhaps you're just feeling absolutely overwhelmed with exhaustion right now. This week, I wanna encourage you to set aside time to focus your life on just being with Jesus, spending time with Jesus, making sure that your inner life is submitted to the mind of Christ so that your outer life can just follow. You know, for three years, the disciples spent day in and day out with Jesus. They watched him, they learned from him, they listened to him, they were corrected and rebuked by him. And they did this before they were ever sent out apart from him to reflect his image. If we want to reflect the image of Christ, we must spend time with Christ. So this morning, I want to offer three ways we can pursue the mind of Christ this week. The first thing that we can do is we can practice Sabbath. You know, one of the most generous and compassionate kind invitations that God gives to us is to set aside one day out of every seven to just rest, to not have to use our power to change anything, to produce anything, to not have to impact the world around us in any way, but to admit that there is only one God and it's clearly not us. When we practice Sabbath, we recognize that it is ultimately God's authority that sustains us, that true flourishing is only found in the grace and the love of God. When we practice Sabbath, we, we step away from the need to make a way for ourselves and we yield to God's sovereignty, to God's direction, God's ability to make a way for our lives. It's a way of just stepping back so that when we go to take that next step forward into the next day, we do so with the humility that God is ultimately Lord over our lives, that we trust that God is the one who is in control. Another thing that we can do is we can take moments throughout the day just to disconnect. I mean, how many of us are just feeling really overwhelmed right now? I know many are tired and exhausted, like Jacob was talking about earlier. I know that many of us feel like we have information coming at us a mile a minute. Our, our thoughts are spinning out of control and, and it's just stressing us out. I think I felt all of this in just the last 24 hours. Let's take moments throughout the day to disconnect to the turmoil of our own thoughts, our own minds, and connect to the heart of God for us. You know, Jesus says in the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You know, the heart of God for you in any season, the most tumultuous, distressing, disoriented seasons, is that your soul would find rest in God. 
So if you feel like the burden you are under right now is becoming just way too much to bear, then I encourage you take moments to disconnect from social media and in its place, connect to scripture, read scripture, disconnect from having any contentious conversations and connect to talking to God. Spend time with God in prayer daily. Maybe disconnect from the news and watching the television screen and connect to going outside and looking at nature and letting God love you through nature. You know, we don't disconnect to ignore the uh, things that are happening in the world around us to turn any kind of blind eye or to be apathetic to oppressive behaviors or anything that we feel that we need to tend to. But we disconnect so that when we reconnect, we do so with the mind of Christ and a soul that is finding rest in God. And the final suggestion for pursuing the mind of Christ this week is to seek out accountability by asking somebody to pray for you. You know, we were always meant to work out what it means to look like Jesus within community, with supportive relationships. And so I invite you this week, locate where in your life do you see misalignment, a lack of integrity between your inner and your outer self. Maybe when you take a look, you might find that there is pride coming out before humility. Maybe there is fear or hopelessness coming out before hope, before trust. Maybe you find that that you are pursuing your own interest above the best interest of somebody else. After you locate that misalignment, ask somebody that you trust to pray for you in that, to speak truth um, into you about that. You know, I believe that, that one of the best things that we can do to direct our hearts and minds toward Jesus is to invite others into that, to pray for us. In times like we live in today, where the best gift that we can offer to the world around us is Jesus, it's absolutely crucial that we have alignment, integrity between our inner and our outer selves. If what is coming out of us is not humble, if it's not sacrificial, if it's not gentle, if it's not full of hope, if it's not kind, or generous, then perhaps it is time to spend some necessary time allowing our hearts and our minds and our souls just to be with Jesus. Hey guys, <laughs> it's Ash and Al, and welcome to our special message for the Vineyard Kiddos and the Vineyard Youth. You guys ready for this? Buckle right. up, here we go. We're going to talk about humility, which is super exciting. And I am really honored and thrilled to start with a poem. Yeah. Such a good poem. That's sweet. Pastor Jacob actually taught us, Pastor Jacob teaches me so many things about the Bible, that in Philippians there's a poem. So he asked if I could read something. And so this is something I wrote a little while ago and I wanted to read for you guys today. Here we go. Jesus could have stayed in his seat. Yet he bent down, he took the form of a servant, the king of heaven, washed Peter's feet. Dang. That's the poem I have for you guys today. That's powerful. And Ash, as you were saying that, I was just thinking, we are actually in seats right now. We are. But Jesus didn't stay even in a seat. Mm -mm. Crazy. He actually got down on his knees mm -hmm. and he washed his disciples' feet. He did. Isn't that amazing? It's crazy. It's and, amazing. And actually, right before he died, he did this. And so he washed their feet and then he ended up saying, do the same thing, be an yes. example like me, and then he died. And the crazy thing is that Jesus is actually a king, not just a king of a specific place on earth, but the king of the world, the king of kings. King, king. And he was the one that could have used his power more than anybody. anything. Yeah. But actually he said that weakness, in your weakness, you find strength and power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so oh. Jesus said, and I'm not gonna be like the normal like kings and governments of this world, I'm gonna humble myself. I'm yeah. gonna serve people. I'm gonna love them. Mm -hmm. And so Ashley wants to share a couple practical ways that you can serve your family right in your home this week. Maybe it's so simple as giving up your favorite spot on the couch, washing the dishes, or letting your sibling pick the movie. 
but there are so many ways you can serve your household that you can humble yourself. And isn't that amazing? I just, mm -hmm. I'm so inspired by Jesus' example every day. Yeah. And we're so happy to get to talk to you about it this morning. Yeah. Um, and it's just, even in this time, a mm -hmm. lot of people are talking and have their yeah. opinions, but what if, we, what if we simply just listened, right? Yeah, what if we humbled ourselves and were slow to speak and quick to listen, to yeah. really bend down and hear what people have to say? Even Ashley and I had a really good conversation mm -hmm. today where we both yeah. had to listen. And, and talked and, about different things, and yep. it was so good. Yeah. Amazing. 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 So. Yeah. All right, guys. We love you guys we so love much. You a lot. That's our message from Ventura. This has been Ash, Ash and Al. Al. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in today for our Vineyard Church Glendora online service. If you have not yet received prayer, please don't hesitate to do that. You can click on the live prayer button and someone would be more than happy to pray with you now. But we thank you again for joining us. We wish you and your family the best this week and every week. Bye-bye.